Well, let's talk about awards, trophies, rules, and everything else. We're going to preview our full bracket coming up in just a moment. To get you set, though, the World Cup starts on Sunday, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern time on the East Coast. And, of course, that is, I believe, 7 p.m. Uh, in Qatar. For the teams, they are allowed 26 players on their roster. That is the most ever in World Cup history. Normally, it's 23. We talked about some injuries earlier today and players being replaced. Every team can replace players due to injury up until 24 hours before their first game. Once you break that threshold, you cannot replace players on your roster for the rest of the tournament. Those players have to come out of the 55-man official preliminary rosters that were entered to FIFA about a month ago for most of the national teams. And the injury has to be assessed and signed off by a FIFA doctor to say, it warrants being replaced on the roster. The only players who can be replaced, which this I did not know, going throughout the World Cup after that 24-hour threshold are goalkeepers. Every team is required to dress three goalkeepers on every match day, which means if one of your goalkeepers gets hurt and you only have two on the roster, you can replace a goalkeeper and bring them to the World Cup, which makes it even more confusing why two of the countries uh, selected four goalkeepers on their roster, but to each their own, Tunisia, enjoy whatever you're doing there. Um, Bobby, you mentioned off the start of the show, this World Cup coming out of nowhere, obviously the first ever Winter World Cup. I mentioned this earlier in the week, but a normal World Cup prep time, Didier Deschamps said in 2014, they had 28 days to go into the World Cup as a full team. Uh, In 2018, they had 24 days. This time it's six days to prepare for four game for for a game every four days rather than normal World Cups in which it's a game every five days. Bobby, let's talk awards. Obviously, everyone's playing for the glory, for the national pride, but they also are going to get paid a ton of money for the World Cup. The winner of the World Cup, the team, will receive forty-two million dollars as an award. That's the most ever in twenty eighteen. France received $38 million, uh, which, of course, at the time was the record. The runner-up will receive $30 million to their federation. Third place will be $27 million. Fourth place will be $25 million. And then you get into the bulks of teams because there are not knockout games all the way through to rank one through 32. So fifth through eighth will get $17 million per federation. Ninth through 16th will get $13 million. And then everyone who gets eliminated at the group stage will receive $9 million per federation. So pretty good chunk of change for a lot of these teams. And to tie that to other recent news right now, a lot of the conversation about the U.S. soccer labor negotiation between the men's and the women's teams, that will now go into the pool that is then split between both the men and women based on the predetermined percentages. So if you've heard about where that money comes from in the pool, well, it's this type of prize based on how you do in the World Cup and the payout from FIFA for that spot. All right, let's get into who we think could win the $42 million at the top of this. Bobby, you set the stage for us on Monday. Remind us again the favorites, and then we'll sort of go through what we think will happen. Yeah, I think it's really helpful to think about the nine favorites in this tournament and then split them into four buckets. One is the clear favorite. And even though I demonstrate a little skepticism on Wednesday, this favorite has actually even increased their odds according to the betting market, which means as more people have been involved, more people and more experts actually think that this team is going to win than even they did at the start of the week. And that is that that is Brazil. The projection for Brazil is they have about a 22% chance of winning this tournament. And the gap from them to second place is actually as large as you'll ever really see in a World Cup, or at least in modern times. The second bucket, which are the two teams that would feel perfectly natural if they were to win, that is Argentina and France. The third bucket, and I think of these teams as, it's not a surprise, but there would be articles written about how they did it, and that is Spain, England, and Germany. The fourth bucket among the nine favorites are the teams that, aren't at the level, it wouldn't make history, it wouldn't be one of those tournaments we remember for an underdog winning, but they are clearly the outsiders among these nine, and that is Netherlands, Belgium, and Portugal. Okay. The last group I want to add today are just the three other teams 
who could potentially win this tournament and it would not be seen as incredibly lucky or incredibly outside the box. And those three teams for a week that there's only nine there, teams. There are nine favorites there. I want to get that clear. There are absolutely nine favorites, but then it's worth acknowledging that there is another group of three where if they were to win, it wouldn't totally shatter the world and it wouldn't be entirely based on luck. And those three teams are Uruguay, Denmark, and Croatia. When Croatia made the final in 2018, it felt weird, but not undeserved. It didn't feel lucky. I think it's the same again for Croatia, Denmark, and Uruguay. So nine favorites, three deserving teams, and then we will say the rest. I hate you so much because our next thing is Cinderella's. Who do we think gets out of the group that's unexpected? You've been giving us the odds every time we've gone into each group preview. Um, who do we think goes the furthest as well from those Cinderella teams? Uh, I will start and say the teams that I had getting out of the group that are against the odds are Canada, mm -hmm. uh, taking care of business in Group F, Japan, taking care of business in Group E, and Serbia out of Group G. Mm -hmm. Those were the ones that I had that are not expected to be the top two teams that I had getting out of the group. Okay. Okay, so before we do all picks, David, I do want to acknowledge that this is true whenever I make picks in sports and I'm like 94% emotional about it and only 6% logical, that if there's an obvious choice, I will take it. But other than that, I pick either the team I want to see advance or set up a matchup that I really want to watch. So I agree with you about Japan and Canada. I also have Cameroon, nice. Ghana, and it feels like if you're going to say Serbia, we should also include the U.S., because they are roughly even even projections on this, I believe. They're are both they? I thought I thought Switzerland was higher than Wales was. Yeah, but they're basically they're they're all basically at fifty percent. Switzerland, Serbia, are right around fifty percent. USA, Wales are both right around fifty percent. They're in that category of group where there's two teams that are basically tied. I would say projection. though, Serbia has never gotten out of the group in their history, so that feels to me like a bigger surprise than the U.S. Okay, sure. If you want to take the easy way out, I'll allow it. That's fine. Okay. Um, so then which one do you have going the furthest? Which Cinderella do you have? Okay. So the, the, the we reason we do this is A, it's fun to talk about Cinderella's, but B, it's also important to note that there is always at least one outsider in the quarterfinals going back to at least 2002. So okay. if we can generally agree on the fact that, you know, there are 10 to 12 clear football in men's nations above the others, there's always at least one outside of that. A quick quiz in 2006, who was that team that made it to the quarterfinals? That made it to the quarterfinals in 2006. Wow. Uh, I can't think. It is Ukraine. In 2010, oh. there were two oh, teams man. to make it to the quarterfinal. Didn't that Ukraine team not win a game? And then they beat Switzerland on penalties who went out without conceding a goal? Okay, uh, Ghana in 2010. Ghana in 2010 and? And Ghana in 2010. Was Uruguay one? Paraguay. Oh, okay. In 2014, it was? We're saying quarterfinals again? Quarterfinals in 2014. Oh, Costa Rica. It was Costa Rica. In 2018, which team outside of the traditional powers made the quarterfinals? Russia? It was Sweden. Oh, nice. I think I think maybe Russia too, but they were the host country, so I didn't count that. Got but you, it. we get the idea. Whenever you make your bracket right now, remember that there is effectively always one team outside of the world powers that makes what? the quarterfinals. Can I just My, interrupt real quick? Mm -hmm. Because you missed the one that I thought we were going to have fun with, which is next week is Thanksgiving in the U.S., and this is going to be the first ever World Cup during it. In 2002, Turkey made yes. the semifinals, and you wanted to title the category, who is the Turkey of the Yeah, year? this is the Turkey pick. Yeah. My Turkey pick is the United States. And this is not this is not necessarily as a homer pick. It right. comes down to the group matchups. The United States is in group B. If group B pairs up against who in the round of 16? Group A. Group A. Group A, their their pot A team is Qatar, which is say they really only have one powerhouse in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. That means that if either the Netherlands slip up or England slips up, all of a sudden the United States if they make it out of the group which I have them doing would have an easier round of 16 matchup and more likely than any other non-traditional power to make it to the quarterfinals. So the U S is my Turkey pick. I think that's really interesting. Uh, we also just got a tweet from Danny Leva who says Senegal are the dark horses where 
I actually think that's the other part to mention. With Sadio Mane going down, there is less fear, I think, for whatever teams are in Group B of who they would face in that knockout because Senegal with Sadio Mane is one of those heavy favorites without him. It makes the road a lot easier. So you have the U.S. going to the quarterfinals. Okay. They're my turkey pick. So you have Canada, Japan, and Cameroon and Ghana all getting knocked out in the round of 16. Correct. Okay, cool. So my pick may be controversial to you. I have Uruguay making the final. Mm. And I think if you've been talking to me about nine favorites for a week now, if I pick one of the non-favorites outside of that to make it so far, because you're only talking quarters, you're soft, you're easy stuff. If I pick a team that far, it should count as a Cinderella run. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I would have I would have accepted Croatia in 2018 as the turkey pick. Thank you. So Great. I think this is fair. Great. So Uruguay is my pick. I also have the U.S. going to the quarterfinals, by the way, uh, and losing to Argentina at that stage. But that wouldn't be my Cinderella okay. run because, yeah. If we are going to pick our, our turkeys and our Cinderellas, then there has to be a flip side. There has to be a most likely bust team. And this are this would be those top 10 teams and which one does not make it out of the group. And mm-hmm. remember, the winner's curse. In four of the last five tournaments, the defending champion has not made it out of the group stage. And then I'll add that on top of that, really since... 1998, 2002, again, there's usually at least two powerhouses that fail to make it out of the group. The only time it wasn't true was 2006, which was relatively chalk down the board. So, David, which traditional power is the least likely to make it out of their group? I have selected Germany as that team. Mm. We talked about it when we previewed Germany. They are one of the most confusing teams at this World Cup in my mind. Uh, They they have a huge variance in the way they've performed. They are coming off the back-to-back two worst performances in German national team history. And yes, they've turned some of the page. Musiala, some other young players will be a big part of this group, Kai Havertz. But I don't think they've reset themselves to the stage that some of these other teams like a France or a Uruguay has done where they have a core that can lead them. And so I have Germany going out in the group stage. I do too. I think if you're going to give me even odds, the most likely bet is Belgium. But my personal expectation would be Germany. Okay. So that's the most likely bust of the traditional powers. The next conversation is the golden boot. Okay. This seems like your favorite conversation. Goal scores, number nines, predictions. Yes, you you nailed it. But what I will say (laughs) is it it was fun creating a framework for it. Because when you think about Golden Boot, you're like, I don't know, it's just like going to be one of the normal people. But Mm -hmm. it's actually not that easy. Because when you look at the list of players, there were, for me, three distinct categories that were created. There were two obvious choices. And I think if you don't pick one of these two, you're thinking too hard and it's not quite, you know, an honest conversation, which is fine. You know, I'm down for those. Um, But the two main picks are Kane and Mbappe. Harry Kane for England, Kylian Mbappe for France. The next two, the next category, are the other mega superstars, but is their job really to score at this tournament? And that's the Lionel Messi and the Neymar. The third category. Part of that category? I would never really put De Bruyne in a goal scoring category. He is a big okay. He has been a big one for Belgium over the last two years. Okay, then I think that's a great ad. All right, I'm down for that ad. The third one is what is the health? or their minutes load going to be like. Mm -hmm. And this is Kareem Benzema, Cristiano Ronaldo, Romelu Lukaku, Lataro Martinez, who I would have picked had he not been displaced by Julian Alvarez in the friendly the other day, which may or may not matter, but it gives me the jeebies. And then Memphis Depay, who was supposed to start for the Netherlands, was the joint leading goal scorer in UEFA qualifying with Harry Kane, but is not going to play at least the first game. So that is the way I think about this David, so who are you picking as your golden boot? I have an absurd dark horse that I'm just going to stick with right out the gates. Mm -hmm. It is Michi Bacuay of Belgium. Lukaku, the the quote from Roberto Martinez is, we learned in 2018 the World Cup is two tournaments, the group stage and then the knockouts. We're bringing Romelu Lukaku to play in the second of those tournaments. That is acknowledging that he will not play in the group stage. So one, 
you've got a Belgium team that put up five goals in a group stage game at the last World Cup. When they get up on teams, they they finish the job. You've got Batshuayi who will get the load of minutes in the group stage. I also actually think he fits really well with this team. He makes those runs into the channel in a different way than Lukaku, who will drop deep and sort of create for them. And with the wing backs that they have, they're going to create a ton of chances for him. So I have them going into the quarterfinals, which I think mm-hmm. is enough games. That gives him five games to load up on the goals. Remember, 2014, James Rodriguez won the golden boot. They only went to the quarterfinals. You don't always have to yeah. make the final. Okay. I'm okay with that pick. No, I didn't even want to do this category because I think golden boot is straight. <laughs> but if I'm going to do it, if you're going to do it, you know I'm going to bring some juice. So I think when you pick the golden boot, you need to find the Venn diagram in the middle between three parts. Who is going to play a lot of minutes? Mm-hmm. Who has a weak group? And then who is going to make a deep run into the knockout rounds? Yeah. I think your pick is actually a really smart one on those accord. For me, I'm going to go with Uruguay's Darwin Nunez. Okay. That presuming, assuming he starts ahead of Edison Cavani, that he's going to play a lot. They're, they do have two teams they could potentially beat up on in their group. And to your point, they can make a deep run. So I will go Darwin Nunez for my golden boot pick. The one we both left out and I think is an obvious one is obviously someone from Brazil because, again, we talked about Cameroon being one of the worst defensive teams. Uh, I believe Brazil will have the advantages to hit Switzerland and Serbia on the break if they want to because they'll be up, and I think they're going to go deep. It's a more of a question mark with them of like who will score the bulk of the goals because so mm-hmm. many people will, but I would point out there are going to be – there have been, especially with VAR and all the other things – a lot of penalty kicks in big competitions yeah. over the last few years and a lot of free kicks. And I think Neymar will step up to most of those. He will also play the bulk of minutes. He is a star player who will be on the field for 90 to 120 minutes because he doesn't really need to come out. So that's the other one that stands out, I think, going into it. Uh, Bobby, before we finish, give me your final and give me your winner of the 2022 World Cup. I am going with Argentina. Uh, partially because, of course, they have the ability to do it, but I also just emotionally really want Leo Messi to get his World Cup trophy because I want to settle these greatest players, this greatest player of the generation, this greatest player ever conversation because it is, for me, so obviously him by so many miles. (laughs) And this stupid rings culture discord ruins it and i just want him to win the most important ring and put the conversation to bed so that for perpetuity we know what our standard is for football greatness it would be his second world cup final in his career which is fairly unprecedented because countries that have won it multiple times they do it across different eras we talked about the few people who have been in them multiple times so that would be pretty big deal for him who do you have them beating in the final i have them i have them beating belgium wow so you believe in Belgium. I do. And I have a reason for that, that I'll bring up in our final section here. Okay. I have already said, I have Uruguay going to the final. I have them losing to Brazil in the final. So I believe that this Brazil team, as the odds say, is by far the favorites. They're balanced. They're settled. They've got every element of the team, up and coming players, veterans now as leaders. And there has never been a big moment that Neymar hasn't stepped up to. People have their issues with him on and off the field. uh, A ton of them. But he has always played big in big games, and I think they have a ton of talent around him. I mean, we haven't mentioned Casemiro's name enough. Every day, 5 p.m. Eastern time, we will be on live to react. We have so much more that we can talk about around these teams, and I'm really excited to do it game in and game out. We will also preview the next day's games every single day because the first games will kick off pretty early in the U.S., and so we'll give you some time to take that in. This is our first preview. 11 a.m. Eastern time on Sunday, the host Qatar facing off against Ecuador. You mentioned them earlier. They are one of the three youngest teams in this World Cup. Uh, Bobby, I think you start looking at this game with the emotion, right? We've seen it in every World Cup. The host country, there is something special. There is only one host country that has never gotten out of the group stage. That was South Africa in 2010. And even then, they scored the opening goal against Mexico. Shavala became a legend around the world. The celebration, the dance, the atmosphere, it is all, I think, some of the memories most people have from 2010 or, or one of the first ones that comes to mind. Now we're going to see Qatar step on that stage. And as I said on Monday, they are the first host to make their debut at the World Cup they auto-qualified for as hosts. So this is a complete unknown that they are stepping into, both for them and for Ecuador, because of the unique circumstance. 
It is, absolutely. And I do very quickly want to go over the main protagonists for these two teams. If you have not been following Ecuador or Qatar's national team, who should you keep an eye on? For Ecuador, it is in the center midfield. It is Moises Caicedo currently playing for Brighton and lighting up the Premier League, likely to move to an even bigger club very soon. And then left center back, Hincapi, currently plays for Bayer Leverkusen. For Qatar, it is the two attackers. It is center forward Afif and the other center forward Ali, both very good. Both will look like they could also be playing for bigger clubs in Europe. And a reminder that um, Qatar played in the 2019 Copa America. So they have some experience playing against South American teams. Um, and I think those are the big names when you come into this. To me, the one big question coming into this is Byron Castillo, who we talked about, the controversy around him. Uh, he was left out of the final roster, whether for injuries or not, we're not 100% sure. When he has missed games in qualifying, Peru, uh, excuse me, Ecuador has played with a back five or a back three, whatever you want to call it. They brought Robert Arbolota, who plays at Sao Paulo week in and week out, in as a third center back, and they brought a winger in as a right wing back. They normally don't play that way. They've normally played in a 4-3-3 with uh, Hincape partnering Felix Torres. That is interesting to me, Bobby, because you know Qatar will come out with wing backs and a back three. Mm -hmm. There's a term called mirroring that people talk about around soccer that I kind of don't understand in which you play the same formation as the team you're facing against. What would be the advantage or disadvantage to Ecuador in doing that? I, I, I understand why you're bringing up this question, but I think it's a very good question. Before we talk about tactics or who might find a tactical advantage, I do just want to point out very quickly that regardless of whatever you want to break down, the home team host nation does not lose this first game. Okay. Right? It's it's like 1994, the U.S. ties Switzerland. 2002, South Korea beats Poland. Japan ties Belgium. 2010, South Africa ties Mexico. 2018, Russia crushes Saudi Arabia. So even when the host nation plays a team they should lose to, they don't lose. So I just want to put that caveat aside before we actually start to break down the game. Okay. Can you know? That, that was fair context? Yeah. Again, yeah. I think the the battle their background is Qatar's probably the worst host we've seen. Maybe. Yeah. I think that's fair. But even still, I think that the host, yes. the host bump is real. Okay. So tactically, your question about the formations feels important to provide the, the level above it, which is the, the macro question in the game is who wants the ball in this game? Right. Both teams are more comfortable sitting deep. Both team both teams are more comfortable playing on transition and letting their talented attackers find ways to score. If you are the team that's going to be forced to have the ball, you at least want to make sure that you have cover behind you because perhaps your tactics aren't right. Perhaps your your seal setup, your rest defense isn't right to make sure you don't get transitioned which for me will always make three center backs make more sense. Mm -hmm. So for me, David, it's not necessarily about mirroring for the sake of making sure you're matching up on numerical advantages across the field. It's more about making sure that both teams have three center backs that on the chance that they are the one that has to have the ball in this game, that they have numbers behind to defect to defend against transitions. For Qatar, those wing backs are massive, especially at left wing back. That's sort of where they create a ton of their attack. We all, as I said, we already know that they're going to play that way. The question is only around Ecuador and how they're going to handle the loss of Byron Castino. Um, you mentioned the two strikers, but Almin Ahmed, the left wing back, he is a huge part of this Qatar attack as well. Any final thoughts for us before we move My on? main final thought is we're back on a show again for a week and you're already gushing over the left back. So I feel like I wing kind of back. did my job. I feel like wing I did my back. job here. Wing backs are different. Wingbacks are not defenders. Bobby, it is a whole new world that they are in. So that is the big game to open things up. That's what to watch. That's what you should watch out for as the lineups come out an hour before the game. Uh, that's what you should be thinking about. How is Ecuador going to play this? As Bobby said, who wants the ball? Who's more comfortable in that moment? Who's left com less comfortable? My guess would be the first 20 minutes of this are going to be weird and nervy and disjointed as the two teams sort of adjust to the atmosphere, the pressure in the moment, then you'll start to see which team settles in and starts to create chances. This is an Ecuador team that has a lot of fun pieces. Center forward's a bit of a question mark. So the finishing at the top of that attack has been up and down, but Ener Valencia has been around for a while and he's the one who's probably going to lead the line 
in this one. So that game, 11 a.m. Eastern time on FS1 and Telemundo, and we will be with you at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time live on Twitter Spaces and then coming out as a podcast. Just search MLS today. Let's close out with some big categories we want to talk about coming into the World Cup. So we are going to be on every single day after Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern time to talk about the games, and we're going to have some running competition, some running categories, awards that we're going to keep updating and keep adding names to to see who will finally win those awards because the biggest thing about the World Cup is winning the Club and Country Today awards for all of these players and everyone else around. We've got one locked in that we're going to do every single day. Right, Bobby? That's right. That is the running list. That is going to be the quote, free for life. Whatever country you live in, you are going to become a hero and you are never going to pay for anything, especially the big things. So whether it's drinks or food or coffee or tea or hotel rooms or whatever it is that you have going on in your country, you are never going to do that. And we can probably guarantee that there are people like Ronaldo uh, Phenomena in Brazil who they live that life. Benjamin Pavard curls the ball with the outside of his foot from outside the 18 into the far corner for France to win, setting up a victory in the World Cup. That man gets free for life. That's the type of thing we're looking for. New nominees every day. It can be small. It can be big. But we want to hear from you on what you think should be in the list. So we have three that we got from fans. We got one is the breakout star, the young star or the unknown person who becomes a star through their performance at this World Cup. One, I think fits pretty well for us, is the best through ball of the tournament. I still go back to James Rodriguez, 2018, hitting a ball on the ground from left midfield, 60 yards on a dime for Quadrado, never leaving the ground. It's one of the best passes I've ever seen. So clearly, I'm pretty excited about that category. And the other one is the best referee influencer, which I think was stated that it's not diving, it's not dark arts. It is who's just casually working the ref the best to their advantage and their team's advantage, which is something that I respect a lot. Yeah. And these are separate from the free for life, we should acknowledge. Yeah. These are these are ones that we're going to update about every round as we yeah. go through. We're going to consider each run through the group stage around. So it'll be three times in the group stage and then mm-hmm. round of 16, quarterfinal, semi, and so on. Uh, we brought our own topics as well to add to these. And then we're going to let either you guys, if you people want to weigh in or add more to us, and our producers, Rich, the two Riches and Galena, decide on which ones we're going to go with. Bobby, what are the categories you brought for us? Okay. My three categories that I would like to introduce into the conversation. The first is you talked about the referee influencer. I would actually flip that slightly and say, which referee will be an influencer? Stop. Which referee will we remember? Because I know that you, looking back at 2014, remember the moment when the referee looked up at his video board and fixed his hair. And I think that there's always quirky moments like that that are fun. And I do want to give referees some attention because they have a very hard job. So I would like to elevate referees to give them them their own moment. The okay. second is I do want us to keep track of which coach had gave the best tactical adjustment in a game. We all remember Roberto Martinez 2018 starting Romelu Lukaku from the right against Brazil in what was probably the most important decision of the tournament. So the best pack tactical choice or tactical match. And then the third is I want to keep track of the best boots that okay. there's always a new launch from every brand. There's sometimes brands we haven't heard of, or we've forgotten about. Hopefully Diodora makes an appearance out here at some point. Um, so I want to keep track of the best boots. Okay. I don't really like any of yours if I'm being honest. So I'm hoping that you lose and I'm hoping that Rich Hernandez in all his referee love is not convinced by you and what you're saying. Uh, My three topics are probably less soccer than you. First one is who is going to be the animal of the 2022 World Cup? Every World Cup, there's an animal that predicts all the things. We had the octopus in 2010. There was a horse and a set of polar bears in 2018. Who is going to be that, whether it's animal or not, prediction phenom around the world that keeps getting it right and everyone keeps going back to? Is it the way someone burns their piece of toast that predicts the bracket in Croatia or something like that. So that's one of mine. The other one of mine is our social media darling. In 2018, it was England with their show, hanging out, Harry Kane, all these pieces. Um, In 2014, it was many of the the parts of the Dutch team. They were having fun off the field, becoming a part of 
sort of the international conversation. So that's my other one um, that I brought there. And then the last one is who's the heartthrob of the tournament because you know there's going to be one. You mentioned a referee fixing their hair. I don't remember that, but I can guarantee you in my household, it was when X player took their shirt off after the game and then swapped with another person. So who is the heartthrob of the tournament? Feel good, Bobby? Do you want me to tell you that yours are not bad? Uh, no, you can be honest. I want you to be honest on this show. I think you're really good at this stuff, and I think you could have done better. Yeah, I could have done better. I agree. Although, the animal one's going to be great. Okay. Because it's going to be absurd. So, it's all for us here, right? Is there Sounds anything great. you need to get off your chest? Before well, listen, we I, 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 know, I noticed that we're running short on time, so you cut the paradigm shift. Oh, that's Sorry. Fine. We'll talk about that later. I mean, one of the conversations we wanted to have is what is the paradigm that comes out of this World yes. Cup? Because for the last four years, since France won the 1990 in the Men's World Cup and women's won the 1990 World Cup, there has been a paradigm that simple tactics and simple strategies work for national teams, which I'm not really sure would have been true in the 10 years previous. So what are the overarching paradigms? Is it about set pieces? Is it about the age of players, about tactics? So that's something we'll also have a conversation about as the tournament goes along. He meant to say 2018 and 2019. I would assume 2014, it was a false nine with Germany winning. And 2010, it was Tiki Taka as a defensive system or dominating possession. Those do those go in line with sort of what you're yeah, talking about? Th there, there's always a, there's always a broad tactical paradigm that comes out of the tournament that we'll just, what will the conversations ongoing? It is the one time as big as other games can be when the entire planet is watching the same thing day in and day out. And that uh -huh. is what we're excited about. And that's what we're about to delve into. We are going to be with you every single day just to enjoy it a little bit longer. There are four games a day through most of the group stage, but I need more than that. So come on with us, hang out, talk soccer. We're going to have guests on throughout the tournament, some from Qatar, some from South America, Europe, Asia, to talk about their teams, what's going on, update us on stories, and then some soccer friends that we just like talking to about the game and about the sport and all of you. We want you guys sending us your topics, sending us your nominees for our topics. Who's your free for life on Sunday, Qatar versus Ecuador? And who's it going to be for the rest of the tournament? As well as Canada's back in the World Cup for the first time in 36 years. And the U.S. is back on the men's side for the first time in eight years. And uh, we're going to try and enjoy it as much as we can going hey. into it. Hey, I'm excited to be doing this with you. It's going to be awesome. Club and country today, every single day, 1.30 p.m. Eastern time on Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern time every day after that. So thank you to you, Bobby. Thank you to Rich Kaufman and Rich Hernandez. And of course, Galena, uh, our overlord and leader who fortunately got a day off here today to hang out. But most importantly, thank you to all of you out there for listening. And we look forward to seeing you again uh, in just two days when the World Cup kicks off.